The selection committee is pleased to name Dr. Dipti Jasrasaria, the 2023 Frederick A. Howe Scholar in Computational Science. Dipti completed her PhD in theoretical chemistry in 2022 at the University of California, Berkeley, under the supervision of Professor Aaron Rabani. After graduation, Dipti joined the Berkelbach Group at Columbia University as a postdoctoral researcher. Dipti's selection as a Howe Scholar reflects both her outstanding research achievements and demonstrated leadership and character. During her doctoral studies, Dipti conducted breakthrough research on the ultra-fast dynamics of semiconductor nanocrystals in the context of developing new technologies for renewable energy. Her primary research developed from first principles, a theoretical framework to study the relaxation of optical excitations in semiconductor nanocrystals. Combining state-of-the-art methods in electronic structure and quantum dynamics, she produced a predictive and explanatory capability that resolved a long-standing controversy concerning the acoustic modes to which excitons in these materials couple. In addition, she uncovered a surprising multi-phonon relaxation mechanism for the breakdown of the phonon bottleneck in nanocrystals, which leads to extremely fast phonon emission rates that agree with 2D experiments. Her theoretical and computational results, in collaboration with experimental groups at Stanford and UC Berkeley, were used to improve the synthesis of nanocrystal quantum dots for better photoluminescence products properties. During her graduate studies, Dipti contributed to 10 peer-reviewed papers in top journals. In her research group, she established herself as an effective leader, organizing pre presentations and discussions within the group, volunteering for additional responsibilities, and ensuring new and prospective group members feel, felt welcome. Dipti has also demonstrated leadership and character beyond her research as a champion for equity in STEM. Seeing a gap in the assumed conceptual and computational mathematics knowledge of incoming graduate students with diverse backgrounds, she took the lead and with three of her peers organized, developed the material for, and served as an instructor for a math boot camp in, for incoming PhD students at UC Berkeley College of Chemistry. The successful short course has now become integrated into the new student orientation. The course materials have been released online for the benefit of others. And a manuscript on this initiative and its results has been made available on Chem Archive. For this effort, Dipti received the College of Chemistry's Graduate Diversity Program Award. If the scientific excellence and leadership embodies the qualities Fred Howe's encouraged in all young scientists and make her a deserving recipient of the award. Please congratulate Dipti. All right, and without further ado, Dipti Joshua Starry. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. It is such an honor to be named um, a Howe Scholar, and I'm so grateful to be here with all of you. Um, as part of the program review again, and also to have the opportunity to share my work. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about work I've done over the past year um, as a postdoc with Tim Berkelbach in the chemistry department at Columbia University. Um, and I'll be talking about a class of material called clathrates, um, and a method that we've been de developing called vibrational dynamical mean field theory to better understand these materials. But before I get into that, I kind of just wanted to talk a little bit about how I got interested in that work. Um, so as Jeff mentioned, and as some of you might remember from previous program reviews, in my PhD, I was focused on understanding optoelectronic properties of quantum dots, or semiconducting nanocrystals. And people have been really interested in quantum dots because their properties, such as the wavelength or color of light that they emit, um, is really sensitive to things like the quantum dot size. And specifically, what I was um, working on was trying to understand how these properties were affected by coupling of excited electrons to atomic vibrations of the nanocrystal lattice. And so I was working on uh, calculating these exciton-phonon couplings um, to describe kind of the effect of those atomic vibrations and understanding its effect on things like exciton cooling, um, photoluminescence, or light emission, and carrier trapping. So in this work, um, we were kind of constantly thinking about these atomic vibrations as being detrimental. They were always degrading the performance of quantum dots or degrading their efficiency. And we were really interested in understanding these atomic vibrations and learning how we could mitigate their detrimental effect. Um, but these atomic vibrations are really everywhere. Everything around us is made up of atoms and molecules and they're constantly vibrating around. And so this kind of made me think like, are atomic vibrations kind of inherently bad or are we always trying to kind of get rid of their effects? 
And so this kind of led me to um, questions that I'm now exploring in my postdoc, which is how can we develop our fundamental understanding of these atomic vibrations and ultimately rationally control vibrational properties of materials so that they can be um, useful to us. So the simplest picture of um, vibrations in a material can be described um, as just a collection of non-interacting phonons, where phonons are quantized collective um, oscillations of a lattice. Um, and you can think of them as just kind of harmonic oscillators, which some of you might have learned about. Um, phonons are carriers of sound and heat, and they can also interact with light, so they're quite important. Um, what I'm illustrating here is just a one-dimensional chain of atoms. We have two different types, red and green, um, that are just repeating periodically. And so because these atoms are all connected to each other by springs, they will be oscillating and they will have phonons. Um, one way that we can characterize phonons are by something called a dispersion relation or spectral function. I'm gonna be showing quite a few of these, so I just kinda of wanna talk about what, how to kind of read them. So on the x-axis, we have um, momentum or a wave vector um, associated with the translational symmetry of our lattice. And on the y-axis, we have um, the energy or frequency of different phonons. So for the simple one-dimensional chain that has two different types of atoms, we have two uh, branches of phonons. We have this lower energy acoustic phonon and then also this um, higher energy optical phonon and atomic motions associated with both of these types of phonons are illustrated here. Um, there are some materials, however, where this simple kind of picture of non-interacting phonons is not applicable. And these are materials that we say have significant anharmonicity or significant interactions between phonons. And materials that have um, significant anharmonicity can be very unique and have interesting uh, properties and applications. One such application are for thermoelectric materials, which can convert between heat and electricity. And they do this by generating an electric power um, in materials that have strong or large temperature gradients. And so good thermoelectric materials have low thermal conductivities that allow for them to maintain this type of temperature gradient. Um, and this is often realized in materials that have anharmonic vibrational structure, or again, phonon-phonon interactions. One such material that's been really promising for thermoelectrics are called clathrates. So clathrates are essentially um, these materials that I'm depicting here, where we have um, atomic cages that are fused together to form a periodic lattice. And inside each cage is a loosely bound atom that's embedded inside each cage. And these materials have low thermal conductivities and are promising for thermoelectrics. Um, and it's because, again, of these phonon-phonon -phonon interactions. In particular, people are interested um, in the acoustic mode of um, the cage lattice and how that interacts with optical modes of the guests that are rattling inside each cage. And so people have theoretically kind of shown strong coupling or hybridization between these two different phonon modes. And people have also done inelastic neutron scattering experiments on these same materials and seen experimentally hallmarks of this strong coupling or hybridization. Um, and so people think this is why clathrates have low thermal conductivities, but there are still a lot of open questions about kind of the anharmonic effects um, and kind of the mechanism that leads to this uh, low thermal conductivity. And that's something that I've been trying to understand. So um, again, this is kind of um, one unit cell of this clathrate material. Um, and on the right-hand side, I'm showing the phonon dispersion relation of that material. And because it's quite a complicated unit cell, it has a lot of atoms in it, we also see that there are now a lot of different phonon modes. So each line in this dispersion relation corresponds to a phonon mode, and we, we have quite a few of them. Um, and doing these kind of calculations on such a complicated system can be quite challenging. And so first, uh, what we wanted to do was develop a sort of coarse grained model of our clathrate system. And so we did that by just um, 
defining our model as a lattice of these large cage atoms um, that interact with anharmonic Leonard Jones types of interactions. And then we also have um, a small guest atom inside each larger cage. And that interacts, um, those two interact between a quartic interaction. And so we see that our um, dispersion relation is a little bit simpler than the atomistic version, but we still retain the essential um, kind of physical properties. And especially we see that we have that um, cage acoustic mode and this guest rattling mode, and we see that they hybridize in our model as well, which is something that we want. Um, but what I've shown you here is just uh, this dispersion relation only kind of gives us a non-interacting phonon picture of our material. We don't have any anharmonic descriptions in um, this sort of diagram, and we want to understand how these phonons couple with each other, um, leading to other interesting properties. And so how do we account for anharmonicity? We do that using something called the single particle phonon Green's function. Um, and essentially what that is, is a correlation function where we have the displacement along a certain phonon mode, lambda, um, at time t. And we see how that's correlated to the displacement along a different phonon mode, lambda prime, um, at time zero. And we can calculate this sort of, for, uh, this sort of correlation function, take the Fourier transform of it, and that will give us an element of our anharmonic phonon Green's function. So we could calculate this using something like a molecular dynamic simulation, where we would explicitly propagate how all of the different atoms in our model are moving in time. However, this can be quite challenging and very computationally expensive. Um, if we want good resolution in K space, we need to simulate very large supercells. And if we want really good frequency resolution, we need to use very small time steps and simulate to very long times, which is often intractable. Um, and so instead, we're gonna write our anharmonic single phonon Green's function in a different way. Um, we will write our, we will write it uh, D inverse in terms of a harmonic or non-interacting Green's function plus some self-energy term where the self-energy essentially includes all of the anharmonic phonon-phonon interactions in our system. And so how do we do that? We do that using um, a method called dynamical mean field theory, which is a class of embedding methods that have been used um, quite frequently and successfully to calculate electronic properties of materials that have strong electron-electron interactions. But um, in our group, we have adapted this method to tackle uh, vibrational problems for strongly anharmonic systems. And essentially, in VDMFT, what we do is we map our uh, periodic lattice onto what's called an impurity problem. And the first step of that is just taking one unit cell of our um, periodic lattice and calling it um, something special. We're gonna say that this is a system that we're interested in. And the system is affected by all of the other unit cells in the lattice. And we'll call all of those other unit cells the bath. And what we can do now is we can essentially um, replace all of those other unit cells with a bath of harmonic oscillators that are coupled in a special way to our system. Um, and so this is essentially what that impurity Hamiltonian looks like. We have our system, which is just one unit cell of our lattice. We have a bath of harmonic oscillators here and they're coupled together in a special way. And what we can do, this um, impurity problem is much easier to describe. And so we can solve for the self energy or the anharmonic interactions in our system. And because our bath is just copies of our system, we can take information from our system and put it back into the bath to get information about our full lattice. Um, and so we're making an approximation of a local self energy, but again, information that we get about our system can be translated to the bath or the full lattice. And so to kind of go into a little bit more detail about what that entails, um, the first thing that we need to do is we need to define the mapping from our periodic lattice onto this impurity, uh, impurity problem. Um, and the main thing we need to do is we need to figure out how our system couples to this special bath. And we can do that by taking the difference between um, our lattice Green's function that describes our periodic lattice 
and our system greens function that just describes a single unit cell of our lattice. And the difference between those two gives us our system BAF coupling, which helps us define our impurity problem. From there, we can calculate the impurity greens function, which describes the anharmonic system that's coupled to this harmonic bath. And we can do that again with some correlation function of uh, displacements of degrees of freedom in our system. And now, whereas previously for the full periodic lattice, calculating this sort of correlation function would be very challenging, now we have a much smaller system. And so it's a lot easier to be able to calculate such a correlation function. And to do that, we use something called the generalized Langevin equation, which allows us to propagate the um, dynamics of the impurity problem. So this is just an equation of motion for um, a degree of freedom in our system, where the first term describes time evolution just due to the system itself. Um, and the second and third terms describe the effect of that bath onto the system. Um, here, gamma is what's called a friction kernel that describes, again, the interactions between the system and the bath. Um, and what we have here is some non-Markovian or frequency-dependent friction, which is what makes our mean field theory dynamical. It allows us to um, calculate uh, lifetimes of phonons. Um, and so with that, we can calculate this anharmonic impurity greens function, and we can also calculate a harmonic impurity greens function, which is a harmonic system coupled to a bath. Um, and the difference between those two gives us the self-energy, which is all of those um, anharmonic phonon-phonon interactions. Um, and from there, we can again take information from our self-energy and put it back into the lattice to update our description of the anharmonic interactions in our full lattice. From there, we can um, obtain a new uh, impurity problem um, and we can solve that again, and we can get a new self-energy, and we can kind of continually go through this loop um, until we reach convergence, when our lattice green function is equivalent to our impurity greens function. So both of these two sides are equivalent. So I've talked about how we can use vibrational dynamical mean field theory to um, calculate the self-energy, which again allows us to obtain an anharmonic greens function. Um, but now we want to use that to generate some sort of spectral function like I showed you before. Um, and we can do that by just uh, inverting that Green's function again, taking the imaginary part um, and taking the trace, and that will give us our spectral function. So previously I showed you kind of these dispersion relations or spectral functions where we have um, a set of different phonon lines, um, and that is what you get in a harmonic picture of these isolated, non-interacting phonons. And so another way of saying that is um, the correlation function of an isolated phonon in the time domain is just uh, something that's oscillating forever at a certain frequency. Um, in the frequency domain, that just looks like a delta function at the frequency of oscillation. When we introduce phonon-phonon uh, interactions, however, we can have now um, uh, oscillation that's now damped or decaying in time, which shows up as a broadened um, peak at that frequency. We can also have frequency shifts where um, we have now oscillations at a slightly different frequency, um, which shows up as a broadened peak that's away from the original harmonic frequency. And we can also have combinations of these things um, that show up together. And so all of these kind of complicated effects of uh, broadening and frequency shifts all come through the self-energy that we've calculated with vibrational dynamical mean field theory. And so now I wanna show you some results on um, the clath rate systems that we've been interested in. So here, again, I'm just showing, um, this is for um, a clath rate called barium, gallium, germanium, where we have these cages made out of gallium and germanium atoms, and inside each cage is a barium atom. And so this is the harmonic dispersion relation, where again, on the x-axis, we have um, momentum due to translational symmetry, and on the y-axis, we have um, the energies of our phonons. So we can do a molecular dynamic simulation 
to obtain our, um, our anharmonic dispersion relation. And we see that it looks somewhat different. We have now um, broadening of our peaks um, because we have anharmonicity that leads to finite lifetimes of all of our phonons. And we also have some frequency shifts. So this is the kind of exact answer, but we see that we kind of have like a patchy um, spectral density. We don't have like the best resolution here. But even doing this simulation was quite expensive and required a simulation of 8,000 atoms. We can do the same thing with vibrational dynamical mean field theory, where now we only need to simulate eight atoms that are coupled to a bath. And we see that we reproduce our molecular dynamics result, but we actually have much better resolution. This looks like a much cleaner plot. Um, so we see that there are effects of anharmonicity in terms of these frequency shifts and broadening, but there's nothing that's like super crazy going on. And so what we can do is we can turn up the anharmonic interactions in our system by replacing the barium atom with a strontium atom. And now we see that there are more effects of anharmonicity, particularly um, the harmonic kind of description of the system shows that that rattling optical mode is um, about like 16 wave numbers. But we see that actually when we include anharmonicity, this um, band really broadens quite significantly, meaning that it has a very short lifetime. It's very short lived. Um, and it also goes up in frequency to about 30 wave numbers. So there are significant effects of anharmonicity at play here. Um, if we wanted to compare exactly how well it agrees to our molecular dynamics sim simulation or the exact answer, we can take essentially a line cut through this dispersion relation um, and, and look at what that looks like. So now the x-axis is energy and the y-axis is essentially the amplitude of our spectral function. And we see that the gray and the blue lines um, match up pretty much exactly, meaning that we, with our method, which is significantly cheaper, is allowing us to reproduce um, the exact molecular dynamics simulation. And we can look at a different line cut in a different part of the Brian zone, and again, we see excellent agreement. Um, so now that we know we have a method that allows us to reproduce the exact anharmonic dynamics, it can sometimes be useful to introduce back some approximations to give us some sort of physical understanding of what uh, the anharmonicity in these systems look like. And so one approximation that could be made is what's called a diagonal approximation, where um, we essentially neglect non-diagonal elements of the self-energy, which means that we um, are including less anharm anharmonicity or we're not fully describing the phonon-phonon interactions. And when we do that, we see that there's quite some deviation here, um, especially between this optical rattling mode and these cage acoustic modes. Um, it just, yeah, isn't really reproducing what we know the true answer to be. And so what that means is that the phonon picture here is really not appropriate. And we have significant anharmonic hybridization between these two modes in particular. Um, and again, having a description of non-interacting phonons or even slightly interacting phonons for this type of material is really just inaccurate. Um, and so with that, I would like to kind of summarize and I hope I've convinced you that vibrational structure can be really important and exciting um, and dynamical mean field theory is a way to include anharmonicity um, in our calculations. Um, and it does so by calculating the local anharmonicity exactly. And for the model cloth rate systems that we've been studying, it can reproduce um, the spectral phonon function or the phonon spectral function um, very accurately. And it's a lot cheaper than molecular dynamic simulations. And it also um, can account for nuclear quantum effects, which I have not talked about today. Um, something that I haven't had time to talk about is how we can use the phonon Green's function that comes out of vi vibrational dynamical mean field theory to compute things like thermal conductivities, which will allow us to make connections back to thermoelectrics that I mentioned um, at the beginning. And the results that I've kind of generated so far tell us that this uh, significant anharmonic phonon hybridization that I mentioned at the end is really key to the low thermal conductivities in clathrates. 
Um, so just in the last minute, I want to talk a little bit about the math boot camp that um, was mentioned previously. So um, this is something that a few of my colleagues and I started at um, the College of Chemistry at UC Berkeley, where we felt like there was a large gap, um, knowledge gap of different math concepts for incoming physical chemistry students. And that kind of uh, created a lot of challenges in the first year of graduate school, which um, as I'm sure a lot of you know, is just a really challenging time professionally and personally um, for a lot of students. And so we designed this five-day course um, that is consisted of these 10 different modules. Um, and we essentially curated content um, along these 10 topics um, and generated a lot of different uh, practice problems. And during this five-day course, we basically just center it around group problem solving um, and yeah, give students an opportunity to interact in like a totally student-centered space uh, before their graduate school really starts. Um, and so all of the content is freely available at chemmathbootcamp.com. Um, and so I invite all of you guys to visit the website and check it out and see if it would be useful to you or um, anyone else you might know. Um, and then the other thing is that we collected a lot of data um, from math boot camp participants both before and after the boot camp. And we didn't see a huge amount of change in math ability over just five days, um, but we did see a lot of qualitative and quantitative data showing that it really helped improve students' confidence in their math ability and also confidence in doing things like uh, working together in groups, um, finding useful resources for themselves, and um, asking for help from peers and from professors. And so we feel that um, the math boot camp has really strengthened students' sense of belonging in the program and in the department. Um, and we're really excited that it's been something that's kind of been adopted by the department, even as um, the grad students and I that started it have left Berkeley and moved on. Um, and so with that, I just want to um, acknowledge um, my PhD advisor, Aran Rabani, and the rest of that group and also my postdoc advisor, Tim Berkelbach, and the rest of that group, um, the CSGF for just being an incredible source of support, um, and I'm happy to take any questions.